So if your code is perfect and there's nothing wrong with it, don't watch this episode of Visual Studio Toolbox where Leslie Richardson will show us debugger tips and tricks. I envy that person. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today is Leslie Richardson. Hey, Leslie. Hi. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Leslie is a PM in Visual Studio land, and sure we're going to talk about debugging tips and tricks. Yes, we are. So there's obviously a lot to cover in the debugging space that sadly a lot of people don't know about. You can spend countless hours debugging that one bug and going through the most tedious steps possible when at the end of the day you just want to get back to writing code, right? Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully some of these tips that I show you are will help you out in and the long run. Cool. And a lot of these have been in the product for a while. Some are new to 2019. Yep. So if you can remember to when there's something that's brand new in 2019, let's call that out. Okay. Um, and otherwise, this is just stuff in Visual Studio. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to be focusing more on the .NET space today, but a lot of these features overlap into C++ sure. as well. So uh, I'm in Visual Studio 2019 right now, and I'm using an ASP.NET Core application. And because I love to read so much, this is an app that randomly gives me a list of books that I can choose to read and add to my shelf or reject, and they won't be added to my shelf. Okay. So this app also has a lot of problems with it. So hopefully we can <laughs> use some of the debugging tools available to us in order to figure them out. Cool. All right. So first up, I have a breakpoint already set in this book manager constructor here. And this happens pretty early on in my program's execution, where it takes in a JSON file containing a bunch of different uh, book-related information, converts each piece of that into a book object, mm -hmm. and then stores each of those in a list. So I'm at the start of my, uh, my function here, but I actually want to navigate to the bottom here instead. So normally that would be when I start spamming F10 or step over in order to uh, get down there, but that can be kind of tiresome, especially because I have this for loop right, right in the middle. So that can take a lot of time, and that's not very productive of me. So the other option, of course, is to just set a breakpoint at the end and then hit F5. But then if I do that, I have to remember to delete the breakpoint afterward. Right, because yep. the next time you run the app and you get up and go for coffee or something, you come back, it's sitting on that breakpoint you exactly. forgot to remove. It's like, oh, yes. OK. It's like, I thought it was going to run without me while I get my coffee, but yep. nope. So um, and another alternative is something called run to click, which I can perform by hovering over the line I want to navigate to next. And when I do that, you'll notice there's this little green glyph icon that shows up. Mm -hmm. And I can click on that, and it'll run all of my code up to that particular line. Which is line. easier than going down there, right-clicking, and then finding run to or set next statement yeah. or whatever it was. This is just quicker. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's kind of like having a remote control for your code and being able to fast forward to where you want to yeah. go. Yeah, so from there, the reason why I went to, to go to the end of this function is because I wanted to hone in on that book list, which stores 100 different books, because I want to quickly inspect each one. And when I hover over it, I get a data tip. But one of my problems that I have with data tips from time to time is that the moment I hover away from it, it disappears. Mm. So if I want to keep it for a while longer, what I can do instead is pin it. And when I pin it, this data tip will stick around for as long as I decide to leave it until I ultimately close it. And you can drag that to a second monitor. Uh, Is yeah, that true? I, um, you know, I haven't actually tried. The <laughs> good question. I feel like that should be possible. Okay. <laughs> but good question. Um, yeah. So and. The good news about this is that when I close out of my debugging session here, it'll still be present even when I start a new one. So now if I wanted to inspect all the contents of this list here, at first glance, this isn't really helpful. Let's say I wanted right. to inspect each book by their names. It would be a little tedious to expand each of these out until I find the, oh, there's the title property, mm -hmm. and then keep going to the next one and so forth until I find what I'm needing. So this also goes for if I were in the locals window as well, or watch or autos. And ideally, it would be a lot nicer if instead of getting the type of object under the value column, I could see particular properties that I'm interested in so right. I can just quickly skim through this list. So thankfully, there is a feature that you can use in Visual Studio that's one of my favorites, and it's an attribute called debugger display. And that is an attribute that allows you to customize your, um, your object, customize how you view your objects in the watch autos, locals, and data tip windows. 
So to do that, I can go into where I defined my class. And at the top of that class definition, I can write in some debugger display syntax. And the curly brackets will return the value of any property or properties, because I can go plural with it. I can also use expressions if I wanted, uh, of whatever property that I specify. In this case, I want to view books by their title property. So mm -hmm. I'm going to type in title. And I'm also going to have to restart the debugging session. But hopefully, this is where the magic happens. So this is uh, an attribute that exists currently in F -sharp, F sharp, C sharp, and Visual Basic. So this is for managed users. But if you're a C++ user, the equivalent that you can use that performs the same function is something called NatViz, where the difference mainly is that you have to create a separate NatViz file inside your project. And then uh, that contains some XML that you can add to or modify in order to perform the thing that I'm about to show you. So um, I need to go back to the end of this function again. I'm going to use run to click. And I have my data tip that I pinned earlier yeah. that's still here because I never closed it. And this is my favorite. This that is the magic. Is yeah. Cool. <laughs> so cool. I love it a okay, lot. Okay, now this is the part where we have fun. How long has this been in the product? <laughs> yeah, longer than 2015, <laughs> longer than 2013. Yeah, <laughs> it's been around for a while, longer than I me, love definitely. That. <laughs> That's my favorite part yep. of the show. I get asked that all the time. Uh -huh. like, so is this a 2017, 2019 exclusive? No. I'm like, oh, no. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. So uh, another thing that I like. you can like, do expressions. Yeah. So you could concatenate a couple fields, uh, Yeah, exactly. Yep. If you wanted to do some simple type of expressions, then you can do that as well if you're interested in seeing what okay. one property plus another could is Could you do equal to. something like a function that says if these three fields are missing, just display incomplete. Then if they're there, display complete. Can you do stuff like that? You can, yeah. You can do some simple um, if conditional type statements as well. Cool. But, yep. But kind of do it at your own risk. My recommendation for when things start to get very complicated in your debugger display syntax is to create another property or function within that class first okay. called like debug debugger display or something like that. Right. Include okay. all of that logic and then you can write the function name inside oh, that makes the debugger sense. display. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so from there, another feature that I like are the text visualizers in Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I have this JSON variable here that stores all my JSON contents. And if I'm looking at it, uh, oh, first I need to actually navigate back to it because this is earlier on in my code and I'm currently out of scope. So what I can use for that is something called set to next statement, which mm -hmm. I think you mentioned earlier. Right. So to do that, I can pretend as if I were doing another run to click, except I can hold down the control key, and that green glyph will turn into the yellow icon, oh. which will automatically move my execution pointer up to that particular line. So that's nice, especially if you want to try out what different execution paths are going to be looking mm -hmm. like, or if you want to go back and re-inspect uh, a previous variable. But you kind of have to use it at your own risk because since you're changing the execution flow in a way that is yeah. not necessarily intended, it could, has the potential to mess with the rest of your code's execution unless you restart and make a new debugging session. So from there, I have the JSON variable. And looking at it, it's not very readable right off the bat yep. because it's uh, formatted for JSON in particular. That, and it cuts off the screen. So if I'm looking at it in the locals window, for instance, there's this magnifying glass icon that's next to that. And I can click this drop down to get a list of different mm -hmm. visualizers I can use. So I'm going to use the JSON visualizer because this is JSON. And this time I get a lot better of yep. a formatted um, view. So I can quickly view this giant string in its proper format, right. which is great. So again, if you had like a string that's catered for HTML or XML, then you can do that as well. Or if you have something that's catered for something completely different, you can also make your own visualizers. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty neat. And uh, also, if you just have a giant paragraph of text being stored in a variable, you can just use the regular text visualizer right. as well. Yep. Cool. Yeah, so uh, from there, now I kind of want to start looking into some problems with my application itself. So I'm going to hit Continue. And so this is the general application. And again, I can go to this Rate Books page where it'll randomly give me a list of books that I can read to add to my shelf or not read, and they won't be added. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I just want to read everything. So I'm going to add <laughs> <laughs> 100 books. Yep, I'm going to read all 100 of them. Uh, you know, 
It depends. It depends on how big it is. I have the goal every year of reading like 25 books. Okay. So I'm not quite at the 100 a year thing. So let's go with four years for 100. So, but I'm noticing that of the 100 books that are supposed to be added to the shelf when I do that, it looks like there's only around half of them. Mm -hmm. So if I go into Visual Studio, I want to double check that out. But also I should receive a notification if I click on the rate books page telling me that all the books are gone. Instead, I get a lovely exception error instead. Uh -oh. So let's try to solve this issue. So I'm going to navigate to my add all to shelf function. And this is my function that will take each book on the rate books page and uh, move them into my shelf. And I'm thinking the problem lies within this for loop here. So I want to see what's going on here. So before I, uh, when I first started coding, I was really big on print statements everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many people in the audience out there love print statements as much as I did, but they're great. Uh, well, they, I graduated to writing things to a text file. Yeah, <laughs> that's great too. Counts, logging. Yep. Yep. But I guess the problem with that, at least for me, is that it would be all over my code even when it's not needed. I'd forget to delete it when I'm done. So I prefer to not modify my code nowadays. So if you do like to log your information to the output window, an alternative you can use is a trace point, which is an offshoot of a regular breakpoint. So that will allow me to essentially perform a print statement without having to modify my code in the process. So I'm going to set a normal breakpoint inside this for loop first, and then I can hover over the breakpoint to get little settings icon. When I click on that, I'm going to select actions. And here I'll get a prompt telling me what uh, I want to log to the output window. Mm -hmm. In this case, I want to see how uh, many indices this for loop goes through before it stops, because I feel like it's stopping prematurely. So I'm going to do index, colon, and then curly brackets, and return the value of variable i. And hit Enter. And I'm going to leave continue execution checked. But if you wanted your, uh, your code to stop right. when a trace point's about to be printed, you can do that as well. You get a diamond icon instead of the circle as well. All right, so I'm going to boot up the program again. I guess that would come in handy if you also come in handy if you wanted to watch the progress of something. Like I was working on some code yesterday that that goes through uh, looks in GitHub repositories um, and it loops through a large number of them. And on some of them, it was there was an exception, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to know which ones through the exception. Right. Without without watching this program <laughs> go that could take hours. Exactly. So I wrote it to a file, mm -hmm. which worked, but it seemed like this way I could just write that information out to the console window, and then I don't have this printing, the saving to a file in my code, which I could accidentally release to production, and then it would right. blow up because someone didn't mess. have didn't have the directory that this is writing to, right? <laughs> right. See, that's what the big risk to modifying the code to do debugging. Exactly. Is you leave that stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, because like I, I'm pretty sure I've done a demo in school yeah. at one point where I left some arbitrary sure. uh, console.log something or other. And I always like write weird quotes in it when I'm frustrated yeah. and trying to debug. So it had said like a random ugh <laughs> like, right. right in the middle of the demo. <laughs> or what idiot wrote this code? It's How like, come this doesn't this? work? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so from here, I'm going to perform that same add all books to my shelf option. Mm -hmm. And this time, I should see some print statements to go with it. All right, so going back into VS, I can go to the output window and scroll up a little bit. And here you'll notice okay. that there's a bunch of related uh, print statements going back with the trace point that I created. Mm -hmm. So this is one way to check out your trace points, but also the problem with this is that these can easily get buried in yep. the sea of stuff in the output window. So the other place where you can check them out that I like is in the Diagnostics Tools window. And this is a window that I have a bad habit of closing usually when I'm debugging, but uh, one of the perks of keeping it open is this because you can filter out events that you see. Oh. I have a bad habit of leaving it open and watching the pretty pictures. Yeah, that's true too. I but do then, love the CPU graphs. And, yeah, yeah, but then, you know, what are you doing with that? Right. <laughs> but it makes you look official when somebody's walking past. It's like, yes. what is that person doing? Although I did use it in this uh, application I was working on to tell 
if there was a problem because the exceptions, and there's like 10 exceptions mm -hmm. that just happened, but then when I noticed that there were 20,000 exceptions or 50 or 150,000 right. exceptions, that was my clue because the way this code works, if it hits an exception, it just sits in a loop mm -hmm. because it's assuming that it just needs to keep trying. Exactly. And then when I got to 400,000 exceptions, that was my clue that, oh, hold on a second. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, maybe I should do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can view your trace points here as well, which might make things a little easier, mm -hmm. too. So from there, I'm noticing that my index value i only goes up to 49 when it should go up to 99. So at this point, I just want to step through like that last iteration of my for loop just to see what's going on with each piece of it. So I'm going to go back to where I set this trace point. And the, now the new problem is I want to go through this for loop, but I don't want to start from the very beginning of it, like from when i is equal to 0, because I'll be there for days, mm -hmm. and chances are I'm not going to pay attention, and I'm going to skip when i equals 49, and then I have to rinse and repeat. So I can use a conditional breakpoint instead, which will allow me to halt my code only under a specific scenario that I give it. So where I set the trace point, I'm going to go back to settings, and I'm going to check uncheck actions because mm -hmm. I'm done with this trace point and check conditions. And from there, I want my code to halt when i is equal to 49. Hit enter and close out. And the conditional breakpoint's been created based off of this little plus icon yep. inside the standard icon. And I'm going to have to restart again. Now those, the conditional breakpoints and things have been in there pretty the, much all, or I don't even remember when those, yeah. were, when those were created. <laughs> I have no idea. Like I feel like I started hearing about Visual Studio around 2013 or whichever one was before 2015. 13. Yeah, yeah, so 13. Okay. So anything past that, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> cool. So again, for forming that same add all books to my shelf action. My code halts this time, and you'll notice mm -hmm. that the value of i is set to 49 instead of 0. So from there, if I step through this uh, for loop, I'm noticing that I used my neutral books.count here as my loop condition. And at the same time, a book is being removed from neutral books at the end of each iteration, which is causing the count to decrease at the start of each new iteration. Yeah. So I think I found the problem here. So I'm going to stop debugging, and we're going to comment out this line, and then just clear all the books at the very end of the function instead. Okay. And that should solve the issue. Get, get rid of that. Now, is there a way, like if, let's say you thought that was the issue, you could add neutral books dot count to the watch window, right? Right. But, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't update in real time as the application's running. Is that true? Oh, it does update in real time. If you oh, add it to the it watch does. window, okay. yeah, and you're stepping, then if it changes, it will let you know that it changed because it usually highlights in red in, the, um, in either the watch autos and locals window. Okay. So. All right. Good. Cool. So from there, adding all books. This time, it looks like there's a lot more books that have been added. Yes. And just to double check, turns out, yeah, I've rated all the books in the library already. OK. So that was conditional breakpoints and trace points, two awesome alternatives to regular breakpoints that you can use in your everyday debugging environment. Cool. So I think what we'll do is stop here and call this part one. Awesome. And then next week, we'll do part two and see more debugging trips. People want to learn more about that. You wrote a blog post on this, right? I Which did. People can check out at aka.ms forward slash debugger display. Yep, it goes through a lot more of, of the different scenarios that you can use with it. And you can go check it out for more examples. And we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox. On today's toolbox, we're going to continue fixing the app we started working on last week, and Leslie will show us additional tips and tricks for debugging.
Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today for part two of our debugger tips and tricks is Leslie Richardson. Hey there. Hey, Leslie. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. You haven't changed a bit since we recorded the last episode. I know. It was almost <laughs> like it happened like five minutes ago. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> so refresh our memories. What did we see in part one? Yeah, so in part one, we talked about a lot of different things from run to click, set to next statement, uh, text visualizers, debugger display, which is my personal favorite, mm -hmm. and of course, conditional breakpoints, trace points, and the list goes on. Cool. And so what are we going to see today? So today we're going to see a lot of different things, including some of the new 2019 features like search for the watch window, oh. manage data breakpoints, okay. uh, and then other pepper, other little things peppered throughout in the watch window, such as return value keywords and format specifiers. All right, cool. Goes on. All right, we're using the same app. Yes. Which, in spite of the fact that we spent all last week fixing it, still isn't 100% nope. correct. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> still many, many problems. We like to mimic the real world on this show. <laughs> right. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so again, as a refresher, this is the same app as in part one, but it's an app that will randomly give me a list of books that I can choose to read and add to my shelf, or I can choose not to read it, and mm -hmm. it won't be added to my shelf. So there's several more bugs that we didn't fix last week okay. or throughout the week either, so they're still here. So let's investigate those. So I'm going to add a book, in this case, this book called Middle March to my shelf. And when I click on it, one of the problems I've been experiencing revolves around this string here that says that I've read the book one time. Already? So, wow. Yeah, already. I know. Well, I haven't even heard this book. a way to get through your 100 books done exactly. if you just click just it <laughs> mark it as read. Right. Yeah, just say I already read it. And then I'm going to predict that that date is an issue. Yep, that date is also an issue. Looking ahead. <laughs> Lots of problems going on mm -hmm. here. Okay. Yep, so what's supposed to happen is when I select I finished this book, this value should increment by one. And it's already saying I read one time, which is ominous in and of itself. Mm. So if I say okay. that I finished this book, it should jump from one to two. But if I do it in this case, it's jumped from one to four. Oh. So either I subconsciously read this book three more times <laughs> in the last 30 uh -huh. seconds, or there's something going on in Visual Studio in my code. So. Oh, and then the date changed. Yeah. Oh, yep. Correct, and, so. mm -hmm. All right. So let's see if we can fix that problem of reading it three additional times yeah. <laughs> out of nowhere. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to set a breakpoint at the start of my index function here, and that will hit when I go back to my shelf page. And from there, I want to hone in on that specific book, which was called Middle March. I can't even remember the title, and I've read it three <laughs> times, apparently. <laughs> so from there, instead of simply expanding until I find what I want, I can use the brand new search tool available in the autos, locals, and watch windows for Ooh, Visual Studio 2019. Yes. So from here, I'm going to do Middle March, I can think I can just say middle. And oh. as you can see, I'm directly taken to where yeah, I need to go. So cool. And again, that is new in 2019. Yeah, it now, is brand new. If I remember correctly, you wrote a blog post on that. I did. I recently wrote a blog post on that where you can go to aka.ms watch window search and All right. to check it out. Cool. For more detailed info. So from there, I have that. And you'll also notice that as I start typing, uh, it will automatically start highlighting for me. So mm -hmm. in the case you don't want to execute the full search, you can just type away. And if it's visible on screen, it'll start highlighting and you can find things that way as well. And especially this is really nice if you have a bunch of items in the watch window at a time, which can <laughs> save you the trouble of having And does that do both the name and the value? Yeah, so you can search for name, value, or type if okay. you wanted to. So if you just wanted to see all the types, I okay. can type in reading list, and Got you it. can see it'll start going. Okay, cool. All right, so from there, I have middle March. And I'm specifically interested in a property that this book has called times read. And this is the property that's supposed to increment every time I finish it. So I'm going to go into times read. Only this time, I get a notification telling me that it couldn't be found. But luckily, it's giving me the suggestion to bump up my search depth to a larger number. So I'm going to change the search depth here to three so oh. that I can search Does more thoroughly. Does it default to two? Uh, for me, I set my default to two. But uh, normally, when you first download Visual Studio for the first time, it's set to three. Oh. Uh, where do you change that? Is that an option? Um, yeah, or, or basically it just, it just remember, remember it the re last thing you yeah, set. Okay. It'll remember. So if Got you it. set your search depth to 10 and then you exit out of the session and start a new one, it will remember that you're a 10. Okay. So. Yep. But I'm going to bump mine up to three. And then I'm taken to that particular property. Again, saving me some time of having to remember where that property is. 
And now the case that I'm trying to deal with is why is this times red property changing without my knowledge? Mm -hmm. And normally this is when I might have to play some trial and error and try to narrow down on where it could possibly be coming from, but I ultimately don't know where that location could be. So I can use something called a data breakpoint, which has existed in C++ for a while, but is brand new to managed code users in .NET Core 3.0 in 2019. So this is a breakpoint that will allow me to halt my code when a specific object's property changes, even if it goes out of scope. Mm. So I'm going to use that in order to track down the problem. So I can right click on that property and then select break when value changes. And I know that the data breakpoint's been created because I have the standard breakpoint nice. icon there. Yep. And of course I can see it along with the rest of the other breakpoints that I have in the breakpoints window. And then if I scroll up a little bit to the top of this item, an object ID has been created. And this is how Visual Studio will be able to keep track of that object if it ever goes out of scope while my mm -hmm. program's running. So from there, I'm going to hit continue and perform that same action again. And hopefully, I get some quick, fast, useful information. Yeah, and so this time, I get a notification telling me that my data breakpoint has been hit with an added bonus of telling me what the previous value of that particular property was and now what the new current value is. And it will also redirect me to the exact location where that change came from. Mm -hmm. So in this case, obviously, it's coming from the property setter, which makes sense. But ideally, I like to know what called it. So I can go into the call stack and then just double click here. And then I'll be taken to where that setter was called. And in this case, it's happening in my get shelled book function, which I don't need because I already set the times read uh, property yeah. to be included so when you elsewhere. Retrieve the list. So the fact that you got the book off the shelf is being equated to reading it. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. Oh, okay. <laughs> Granted, that's kind of what I did in high school from time to time. If I didn't like the book, it's like time to go to Spark Notes, but I'll buy yeah. the book anyway just so <laughs> it looks kind of legit. <laughs> so there's another. Uh, blog post that you wrote on this as well, right? Manage data breakpoints? There is, yep. Uh, yeah, definitely go check it out at aka.ms manage data breakpoints. Manage data breakpoints. Yeah, all right. <laughs> kind of a mouthful, but. We'll have these in the show notes. Yeah, so it's all good. All right, cool. <laughs> Great, so now that I've found the issue, I'm going to comment out this line. And that is, that is really helpful because you're now being notified when it changed and then go finding out why and then you get to decide whether that's valid or not. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Cool. So it can be great in several different scenarios. That can save a ton of time. <laughs> right? Yeah, you don't want to play trial and error all mm -hmm. the time nonstop, right? So this is currently a .NET Core 3.0 exclusive feature at the moment though. Ah, so um, okay. yeah, you're going to need to get 3.0 and play around with that if you want to check these out and in managed code land. Is it scheduled to make it into framework or is that TBD? TBD. Okay. We've gotten a lot of uh, feedback about that. So it has not been forgotten. We are acknowledging that okay. and going from okay. there. Cool. So going back and performing that same action, in this case, I'm going to read some other book I've never heard of called Miss Dal Mrs. Dalloway. <laughs> but this time, Classic. correctly, it tells me I haven't read it yet. So okay. <laughs> that's a good sign. And if I say I finish the book and go back to it, it's increased Perfect. from zero to one. So. Yeah, those are data right. breakpoints and searching. So data breakpoints, again, are extremely useful for many scenarios. In that case, I just wanted to hone in on a specific object, so it's mm -hmm. great for that, especially in contrast to if you were to just set a breakpoint on that property setter where multiple objects could be accessing that, and maybe you don't want that. Yeah, It's also good if you have um, a global variable that's being accessed across multiple right. files and things, and you don't know where it's being modified, and you can use that for this. Yep. Or maybe you just inherited like one of your teammates' pieces of code, and you're unfamiliar with it, but mm -hmm. there's something going on in it that's causing uh, a property to change without your knowledge. So then you can use a data breakpoint to hunt it down instead of having to play, well, maybe it's in this area. Yeah. I don't know what this piece of code does, yep. but let's try it cool. type of deal. All right. So from there, there's one last bug that I want to deal with. It's not so much of a bug so much as an added addition on my part. But the line right below read one times, it tells me when I last completed the book. But I have a tendency to read multiple books at once and can finish several books in one day as a result. So I'd like to know also the exact time that I finished it as well. Oh, OK. So uh, that's currently not there. So I want to go into Visual Studio and see where I can add that. So I'm going to set a breakpoint at this line here that returns that related string about when I finished the book. And 
refresh the page. And just looking at it at first glance, there's a lot going on on this line. I have a nested function call happening within a parameter mm -hmm. of an outer function call, and then there's a property value being set. It's a lot. So I want to break down this line of code and see what pieces of the string are coming from where, just so I have a better understanding of what's happening. So the first thing I want to look into is the person.toString function. But as it stands now, if, you, if I were to try to use step into or step over or any of those, there's not really a way to get into that nested, um, that nested function from right. there. So I can use step into specific in order to choose which of these function calls I want to go to first. Is that new in 2019? No, this has been around. <laughs> yeah, this is not a 20. Yeah, <laughs> this is an old one. Awesome. <laughs> yep. So it's been around for a while. So I can right click <laughs> this line, <laughs> and I can go to step into specific, and I'll get a drop down with all the different places I can go to. There, you know what? There, we need to add a feature to Visual Studio where when you hover over something, it will tell you when it first appeared. Right. <laughs> That would be amazing if there's an extension for that. Yeah. Where it's like a Visual Studio History extension. I'll exactly. Tell you when it came out. Yeah. So. <laughs> Just for fun. Yep. So you can pull your hair out wondering, <laughs> how did I not know about that? Seriously? <laughs> and you can lard it over your friends. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So from there, I can select person.toString. And just as if I were to use the regular step into, It'll oh, take me into that cool. function. Mm -hmm. Yep. So super great. So this one's pretty straightforward. It's just returning the value of the parameter that I gave it, in which case it was just my name. So I'm going to step through it and then step out. Then I'm back to this line again. So from there, now I want to look into the finish to string method here. So again, using step to specific, I'm going to select that one. And here I'll be taken to the finish to string method. And I have even more stuff going on here. I have some string concatenation going mm -hmm. on. So first, I just like to see what is the exact return value with this method. But normally, in order to do that, because it's not currently set to a variable, at first I would think, oh, great, now i got to stop debugging and then set it to an arbitrary value variable and then look in the watch window or something what that variable could be. But another way that you can look at this return value without having to stop debugging and do all that is to step to the end of that function. And you'll notice that in the locals as well as the autos window, there is a line that has the return yeah, keyword on okay. it. And that will tell you exactly what's being returned by that function. So that happens by default. So you don't have to do any other additional legwork in order to see the results of something that's nice. not set to a particular variable. Mm -hmm. And another way that you can do this is also in the watch window. So I'm going to add dollar sign and then return value. Oh. And then I get that same result. Okay, cool. So the added cool. bonus about being able to do that in the watch window is that I can also add format specifiers to it, which um, are things that allow me to temporarily view the contents of the watch window in a different light. So if I wanted to remove the quotes around the string, for instance, because they're kind of redundant at this point, I can add a comma to the item that I have here. And I'll get this drop down, which is new to 2019, with a list of different format specifiers I can use. So instead of having to memorize the giant table that's, uh, that you'd have to look up online, it'll give me some options right off the bat. So I'm going to select NQ, which stands for string with no quotes. Hit Enter, and that will And that's the just in the watch window. You're not actually touching the running code, right? Correct. Okay. Yep, I'm not filling with the cool. code itself at all. all right. Yeah. So great. From there, I now want to step into yet another function. I have this finished book string here. But again, I am now out of scope because I've reached the end of the function. So I need to get back to it. And I'm going to use set to next statement again. Mm -hmm. And there's several ways you can use set to next statement. I can actually drag the execution arrow up if I wanted to instead of holding down the control key like I did previously. So from there, once more, we're going to use step into specific, and I'm going to select finish book string. And here I'm being taken to yet another function with more string concatenation going on. So let's say I wanted to break down this line of code. So I can use return value again. And again, I'm going to step to the end of the function. And this time, so I have the final result here, mm -hmm. of course. But if I wanted to break it down even further, then I can do that as well by adding return value. I can do return value 1. 
and that'll give me the result of this dot title. Oh. And if I wanted to get this last red date thing over here, then I can also do return value three, and that will give me uh, the value of this too. Interesting. And this also goes for if you're looking in the locals and autos windows, it will so show you So what would you, you do pieces. that rather than just, if you hovered over this dot title, it shows you that information, right? Mm -hmm. And if you hovered over to short date string, it shows you that. Yep. You can also add those to the watch window. So when would you, what's the value of being able to specify return value one, return value three? Um, you know, it's just another kind of variation to be able to look at what's being returned on top of that. If you're doing it in the watch window, you can mess around with, again, format specifiers okay. and stuff right. and just kind of keep everything grouped together. If you're, I like to say organized, so I'd prefer to just have all the return values stuff okay. grouped okay. together. Cool. Yeah, so. All right, and from there, I have found where I can add my time-related scenario because mm -hmm. I have this two short date string function here that I don't need in order to show the full time and the date. Right. All right, and from there, I'm going to continue running my code. That is known as edit and continue. That is edit and continue. That's <laughs> yeah, that's some magic that sometimes <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yes. And this is a scenario where it should work because if I refresh this page, I remember page, when that was introduced. You're right. That was amazing. <laughs> when was it introduced? Because well, I, I think it, you know, I if it was 2015. I told you that I knew the date, then I'd have to admit how old I am. <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Yep, so we are making... I'm old enough to that. remember when that was introduced the first time. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yep, so it's a nifty tool when it works. We are making improvements on it as we speak, however. Cool. So, uh, yeah, from there, I just refreshed the page, and as you can see, I now have the time. And that was return value, step into specific, uh, format specifiers. Excellent. And then, uh, you know, set to next statement, made a reprise as well, so... Cool. So now the app is perfect. Yeah, now it's absolutely perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm <laughs> never going to have any trouble with it ever again. Cool. So over the course of these two uh, parts, we've obviously seen some things that we knew were in there, um, learned a lot. Um, I saw a number of things I didn't know were in there, including some things that have been in there for a while. Um, so this has been great. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me yet again. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.